objective now is to construct evidences which lead to and validate the tectonic plate theory. Let's start by looking at the distribution of earthquakes and volcanic eruptions in the world. Here is a map of earthquakes with magnitudes greater than 5 in the world. Earthquake epicenters are clearly not incoherently distributed on Earth. They are much more common beside trenches. Here is a map of volcanoes in the world. Similarly, volcanic eruptions are also clearly not incoherently distributed on Earth. They are much more common beside trenches, just like earthquakes. Let's now look at the map, which includes both a distribution of earthquakes in yellow and volcanic eruptions in red. We can see a significant correlation between earthquake occurrences and volcanic eruptions. There are also some exceptions. Let's look at these correlations and non-correlations in more detail, starting with the correlations. As you can see in this picture, there are correlations between yellow and red dots. These correlations are quake-eruption correlations. The whole of Central America is under the twin threat of earthquakes and volcanic eruptions. An earthquake in Guatemala in 1976 caused 22,000 deaths. In Nicaragua in 1972, an earthquake led to 5,000 deaths. And an earthquake in El Salvador in 1986 caused 10,000 deaths. Volcanic eruptions occurred in Irazu in 1964 and Arenal in 1970, both in Costa Rica. The black arrows in this picture indicate red and yellow dots close to each other, indicating these correlations. On the west coast of South America, an earthquake in Chile in 1960 caused 5,700 deaths and one in Peru in 1970 left 66,000 dead. The volcanic eruption of Nevada del Ruiz in Colombia in 1986 left 23,000 dead. Ecuador and its capital, Quito, are under the threat of both volcanic eruptions and earthquakes. Again, the black arrow in this picture indicates red and yellow dots close to each other, indicating these correlations. In the Pacific Rim, that is, cities located around the edge of the Pacific Ocean, the situation is quite similar. Volcanic eruptions and earthquakes have occurred in New Hebrides, in New Zealand, in Papua New Guinea, and in the Philippines. Japan is well known for its volcanic eruptions and earthquakes, as are Indonesia and the less densely populated areas of Kamchatka and Alaska. Again, the black arrow in this picture indicates red and yellow dots close to each other, indicating these correlations. Let's look at cases where there are no correlations between earthquake occurrences and volcanic eruptions. Remember, earthquakes are the yellow dots and volcanic eruptions are the red dots. Here is an area with earthquakes but no volcanoes. Please pay attention to the black arrow. You can see that there are many yellow dots but no red dots. Let's talk more about earthquakes with no nearby active volcanoes. 
On July 26, 1963, a 6.1 magnitude earthquake occurred in Skopje. In the present day Republic of Macedonia, then part of Yugoslavia, killing over 1,070 people. About 80% of the city was destroyed. Yet there are no active volcanoes in the region. China has experienced numerous earthquakes, but has no active volcanoes. On May 12, 2008, more than 67,000 people died when a 7.9 magnitude earthquake struck Sichuan, Gansu, and Yunnan provinces in western China. On April 14, 2010, an earthquake with a magnitude of 6.9 struck Yushu, Qinghai, in China. 2,698 people were killed. An example of a region with no earthquakes but active volcanoes is Reunion Island. On Reunion Island, there are spectacular volcanic eruptions, but no serious threat of earthquakes. In these photos, Lava spews from the Pitten de la Fernaise volcano on the French island of La Reunion in the Indian Ocean. It is one of the most active volcanoes in the world, erupting almost every year with fluid basalt fountains and flows. Please look at the white arrow in the map. The arrow indicates Reunion Island. Notice there is no yellow in this island. Therefore, no earthquakes. Now we will talk about continental drift from geological observations. There is evidence of continental drift. Alfred Wegener proposed that all of the continents were once part of a large supercontinent called Pangaea and the surrounding ocean called Pandalassa. Pangaea fragmented into separate continents that drifted apart. Wegener proposed, Wegener's proposal, of, I apologize, was based on similarities in shorelines, distinctive rock and fossil groups found in Africa and South America. Let me repeat this. Alfred Wegener proposed that all of the continents were once part of a large supercontinent called Pangaea and the surrounding ocean called Pandalassa. Pangaea was fragmented into separate continents that drifted apart. Wegener, Wegener's proposal was based on similarities in shorelines and distinctive rock and fossil groups found in Africa in South America. His idea was that Earth's surface changes continuously. Earth looked different in the past. Earth will look different in the future. The fragmentation started about 200 million years ago. Let's watch this animation of how the fragmentation occurred millions of years ago. We can see that India was part of Southern Africa. It has moved over time to become a part of South Asia. We can see how West Africa was connected to East Coast of South America. Today, the two continents are separated by vast ocean. We can also see how North America was connected to Europe. Today, the two continents are separated by vast ocean. So how can we go about proofing continental drift? Here are some cause and effect scenarios. 
If the continents were to move back together, their outlines should match. If the continents were once joined, they should have the same ages in types of rocks and fossils. Ancient climates, called paleoclimate, must be similar if not identical. Mountain belts that terminate at one coastline reappear on land masses across the ocean. Similarities of rock structures in both sides of the Atlantic. Green areas are block ancient crust. Light maroon are young rocks. Lines are faults and folds. The concept of matching geology between the two continents has been very important for oil and gas industries, actually the mining industry in general. Let's talk about rock types and structure evidence. Distinct rock types and geologic structures on both sides of the Atlantic Ocean, also known as the concept of matching geology between the two continents, has been very important for oil and gas industry, actually the mining industry in general. There are large reserves of oil in ultra-deep waters, that is, more than 1.5 kilometers water depth of the coast of Brazil. Similar large reserves are expected in ultra-deep waters of West Africa. Let's talk about geology observations. Identical fossil organisms in eastern South America and southern Africa are separated by thousands of kilometers of open ocean today. 22 billion year old igneous rocks found in Brazil closely resemble similar aged rocks in Africa. There is evidence of extreme changes in climate. 300 million years ago, ice sheets covered extensive areas of the southern hemisphere and India. Layers of glacially transported sediments of the same age were found in southern Africa and South America as well as in India and Australia. Here is another validation on this map. Let's talk more about Wegener's critics. Wegener's continental drift model was rejected by his peers. His critics argued that continents are too large to move. His observations of paleoclimate, coastline, and rock age similarities between continents were dismissed and characterized as just coincidental. One of the weaknesses of Wegener's argument was that he did not propose a mechanism of continental movements. Moreover, Wegener incorrectly suggested that continents broke through the ocean crust much like icebreakers cut through ice. The idea of mantle convection, which was included in Wegener's arguments, was actually proposed by Otto Amperer in 1906, well before continental drift models, but this theory had already been rejected by Wegener's time. It resurfaced only after Wegener's death, Anyway, it is well accepted today that Wegener's hypothesis was correct in principle, but contained some incorrect details. That is how science sometimes works. Now we move to continental drift from geophysical observations. Technological advances in the 1950s and 1960s provided new data to geophysics. Since 1968, ocean drilling ships have drilled hundreds of deep holes below the seafloor. Geologists and geophysicists 
have used cores to determine the age, character, and origin of the materials, and therefore they have developed a better understanding of continental drift. Earth's magnetic fields of the past are preserved by the magnetism of the minerals of rocks. This figure shows the curves of the North Pole for North America in red, Europe in yellow, and Africa in blue, derived from the analysis of the magnetism of minerals of rocks. We can see that the North Pole has moved a great deal over the last 500 or so million years. These poles were also geographically distant from its current position. Every continent has a different polar curve, also known as polar wandering. So if you assume that the pole is fixed, then the continents must drift. If you assume that the continent is fixed, then the pole seems to wander. Since the apparent polar wandering path for each continent is different, the continents must be drifting relative to each other. Therefore, we have additional compelling evidence of continental drift. Sonar, that is, echo sounding, and bathymetric profiles, that is, depth in the 1950s and 1960s are the main tools which led to the first proper investigations of the seafloor. They provided the maps of the seafloors. Then we discovered that the seafloor is divided by a large ridge system that are continuous around the entire globe. Deep ocean trenches with elongated troughs, often more than 10 kilometers deep. Seamount chains, that is, isolated submarine mountains. And right angle fractures in the mid-ocean ridges, and more. Before the 1950s, it was assumed that the geological characteristics that exist below the oceans are like the geological characteristics of the continents. Oceans are just continents submerged below the water. That hypothesis was totally wrong. The discoveries of the largest mountain range under the ocean, exactly midway between the continents. The discoveries of very deep oceanic trenches always associated with volcanic arcs and oceanic island arcs, and the discoveries of oceanic islands, seamounts, and atolls have totally changed our understanding of solid earth. Again, here are what geophysicists discovered on the sea floor in the 60s, which is amazing. Here, mid-ocean ridges are elongated submarine mountain ranges, two to three kilometers higher than the average sea floor. Deep ocean trenches are elongated troughs, often more than 10 kilometers deep. Seamount chains are isolated submarine mountains. And fracture zones are right angle fractures in the mid-ocean ridges. The Mid-Atlantic Ridge is the longest mountain range in the world. It separates the Eurasian Plate from the North American Plate in the North Atlantic, and the African Plate from the South American Plate in the South Atlantic. In this picture, you'll see another view of the Mid-Atlantic Ridge with fractures. In summary, before the 1950s, it was assumed that the geology below oceans was just like the geology of continents. It was believed that oceans were just continents submerged below water. This is totally wrong. 
Ocean topography is very different from continental topography. Discoveries of the largest mountain range or aerial extent were under the ocean and exactly midway between the continents. Discoveries of very deep oceanic trenches, 10 kilometers below sea level, are always associated with volcanic arcs, continental arcs, or oceanic island arcs. And there are discoveries of oceanic islands, seamounts, and atolls. These were all really big surprises. Remember, there is a large selection of iMode education lectures which can further enhance your knowledge of earthquakes, volcanoes, climate, and energy. Thank you for your attention and good luck.